So our big question is for reproducibility: Will my is will my program run on somebody else's computer, even though it ran on mine? And remember, we aren't really worrying too much about Python uh, specifically, just programs in, in general. And so the first big piece of that was hardware. The second big piece is well, what operating system do we have? Um, the two most common ones that people have in this class are, are generally Windows and Mac. Um, another really important one though is uh, Linux. Um, Linux is more uh, common than you might think. Um, most of the things running in the cloud are running on Linux. Um, Linux was kind of the parent of uh, Android, so I'm sure a lot of you have Android phones. There's lots of different flavors of Linux, maybe Red Hat, um, Ubuntu, and um, we're actually going to be learning a little bit of Ubuntu Linux this semester. Um, that'll be kind of one of the not one of the key things that we're focusing on, but you'll pick it up a little bit, which is a good skill to have in general uh, to know another operating system. And, and, and kind of worrying about the operating system is maybe what we're going to do when we're thinking about reproducibility. Okay, so operating system, I'm going to abbreviate OS. Um, the, the OS worries about what jobs we want to run on our computer, right? Or I guess what processes. And it kind of has two jobs with this regard. How can it allocate uh, resources to these processes and then also abstract those resources? And so abstract is kind of a funny word. I'll talk more about that. Um, let's talk about allocation first. So here what I'm showing is that process A is running on the CPU. And it turns out that well, at least you know an older CPU could only run one process at a time. Uh, but of course, we're used to having multiple programs in our computer running. So, so how did that work? Um, what these CPUs would do is they would have a bunch of um, processes that are waiting to run, and it would cycle through them. It would run process A for a little bit, and then it would run process B for a little bit, maybe some others, and it might come back to process A again. And it could be switching between these so fast you wouldn't even know. As a human using the computer, it feels like it's running them all at the same same time. Right? So that's kind of how a, how a CPU works. And, and, and there's some details with modern CPUs, but this is very close to true today too. Right? So CPU cycling between these. Who decides who gets to run when? Are all the processes equally important? Um, you know, is there some that are more important than the others? Maybe I'm doing a big download. Maybe that's not as important. And so the operating system is the one that gets to decide who gets to run when. It's allocating the CPU resource to a process. That's an operating system decision. The other thing an operating system does is, actually, one more aside, right, on allocation before I move on. I was talking a little bit about modern CPUs. It, it turns out that modern CPUs have multiple what we might call cores on a single chip, right? And each of these cores is like a CPU in and of itself. Um, and it's not a huge number. Maybe we might be talking like I might have eight cores on my computer. And each of these can be running a, a process at the same time, right? So, so on my laptop, maybe I can run eight processes at a time. Still, I probably have a lot more um, around that are waiting at any given point in time, right? So this still... Uh, we still have this importance of the operating system deciding who gets to run when on what CPU. Okay. Um, now, the way we've always been writing code in the previous course, our program runs on exactly one core at a time. And, and even if the others are not free, they just aren't used. Right. So one of the things we're going to talk about at the very end of this course is how we can write our programs in a way that they can use multiple cores. And if you have something like eight cores on your CPU, Maybe that means your program will, will run eight times faster, right? And kind of if everything works out. Um, so that'll be something that we'll revisit later in the semester. Okay, this other piece. So operating systems that allocate resources and they abstract resources. And abstraction is kind of this funny detail or a funny word or concept. And, and what, well, one way to think of it is that you're hiding things. Um, so for example, what, well, why would I want to hide something? Well, in, in my laptop, maybe I have a, a hard drive, and, and down below I have this picture uh, of this hard drive which has like a magnetic platter, and on that platter there's all these zeros and ones, right? That's what, maybe you've heard that before, that on hard drives they're storing zeros and ones. And um, at the end of the day, I'd like to really save all my data there. And uh, But dealing with zeros and ones doesn't sound very convenient. Um, a hard drive doesn't have any concept of there being separate files or directories um, or any of that. 
right? So how do I actually use a hard drive and not have it be a huge pain? Um, well, the operating system takes care of that. I can write programs that read and write files and the operating system then, let's say I'm writing a file, the operating system will figure out, well, these are the, the zeros and ones I want to write in a specific place on the hard drive to store that file, right? So the, the operating system is kind of hiding all these details about hard drives from me. It's easier to just store my data if I think in terms of files, right? And it's also kind of adding this new notion, right? I mean, the hard drive doesn't know uh, about files, but the operating system kind of invented this concept of files that's easier to use. That's not abstraction, right? It kind of separates my easy to conceptualize parts from what's actually happening uh, in the physical world. Okay, so that's what an operating system does. Um, it allocates and abstracts resources. And, um, and, and this is kind of like the new picture now, right? So uh, before we had a picture of a CPU, an interpreter, and a program. And, and now I need to squeeze in a picture of an operating system, which I'm doing. And, and, and what I want you to see here is that both the uh, Python interpreter and the operating system, in this case Windows, has to fit the CPU, right? So those both fit the CPU. And, um, and sometimes uh, the Python interpreter is directly working with the CPU and, and maybe sometimes it's working through the operating system. Now, you might wish that the Python interpreter would hide all of the details of the operating system just like it does the CPU, but it, it doesn't. It kind of the details of the operating system uh, show through. So that's what I want you to kind of see here, right? The Python interpreter is on top of both the CPU and the operating system. And for the pure CPU part, it hides those details pretty well. Uh, but for the operating system part, uh, it has some shape to it. And I need to make sure that my Python program, in this case, bad.py, fits the operating system. Right? And you've all seen examples of that, right? On the right, I have f equals open forward slash data forward slash file.txt, right? And, and that won't work on Windows, but it will if I change it to these backslashes. Right? So you have to worry kind of about how to fit your code to the operating system. So it's very easy to write things that aren't reproducible. Now, some of you are probably remembering how to fix this issue. And, um, and well, that's with os.path.join. You just call this thing and then, then it will actually use the right slash for you, right? It'll make it work. And that's a good solution. You should write your code that way. Now, there's another solution which has some pros and cons. That solution is tell, tell anybody that wants to run your code, you know, if you want to run my code, make sure you're using the same operating system I do. Well, I chose Windows, you better use Windows. And there's some trade-offs between these. Um, one is that, you know, we aren't kind of bossing people around about what operating system they, they use. Uh, but the disadvantage of option one is that maybe I forget to do that. And it's hard to catch those places where I forget, where solution two is a little bit safer, right? Um, it's unlikely that some oversight on my part will mean my program doesn't run for somebody else. That's actually very common, right? It's very, uh, it's, it's okay to tell somebody, hey, this program has to run on Linux or on Windows or on, on Mac. Okay, now you can imagine when that's a pain, right? If I say, ask somebody with a Mac to run a Windows program, uh, I don't wanna ask them to buy a whole other computer. I mean, that would be a huge, huge cost, right? And so there's this special software that has kind of worked around this. And the software is called Virtual Machine Software. And what it does is it kind of creates a fake machine on top of a real machine. And it could create multiple fake machines or virtual machines on top of one real machine. And you could install a different operating system on each one, right? So, so here, maybe I have my physical machine I bought. And by machine, I mean the stuff like all the hardware, like the CPU and memory. And it's a Mac, right? So I have the Mac operating system running on top of it. And on the left, right, you can see I'm running Mac programs. But maybe I also installed two virtual machines. And on one, I put Linux. And on one, I put Windows. Now, on my one laptop that's set up this way with my two virtual machines, I can run Mac programs, Linux programs, uh, and, and Windows programs, right? So virtual machines are great for reproducibility because they kind of decrease this cost of demanding somebody else run your code on the same operating system. Okay, so we're gonna be using virtual machines uh, the whole semester. That's where you're gonna do all your projects. And that's gonna kind of save all of us some hassle, right? Because you're gonna be using a virtual machine 
with Linux on it, um, odds are that if the tests are passing for you, it's pretty good odds it's going to pass for us too because we're going to have the same setup. Now, so that's the original purpose of virtual machines, right? How can we kind of uh, run multiple operating systems? Uh, but there's another uh, benefit to them uh, that's maybe even more important, but it's right up there. And that is, well, we can pack a lot of virtual machines on one, one computer. And if, if they're all kind of busy at different times, we can kind of almost cheat. We can make it look like we have more computers than we actually do. And this is the fundamental idea of economics of the cloud. Um, you've probably heard of the cloud before. I mean, there's different cloud providers like Amazon and Microsoft and, and Google. And, and what they're all doing is they're buying um, a bunch of powerful computers. And for each powerful computer, they might be putting dozens of virtual machines on it. And then they rent those virtual machines on, say, a monthly basis. You can rent a virtual machine in the cloud, say, for $15 a month. And, um, and, and the great thing is they can kind of cheat and they can pack more virtual machines on there than they should because odds are not everybody is using it for the same time, even though they're charging uh, $15 a month for it, right? So they can, they can profit that way, right? Um, it's almost like you have a parking lot where you're kind of selling spots in the parking lot and you know not everybody you sell a spot to will show up at the same time, right? It's kind of like that, but a more extreme uh, situation, right? So that's what they'll do. They'll, cloud providers will have these virtual machines and they'll rent them. And, um, and we're gonna be renting them this semester, actually. You'll set up some virtual machines on Google's cloud and, uh, and don't worry about the cost because generally they have a, a credit when you first sign up, um, when, you know, you know, hundred dollars worth of credit and you probably won't end up paying anything. Okay, so when you have these virtual machines running in the cloud, how do you get access to them? Well, uh, we're going to use something called a secure shell. That's going to give us a remote connection. Uh, on my Mac, right, if I open up the terminal, um, I have bash running there, the bash shell, and I can run those commands on my computer. If inside of bash I start something called an SSH session, a secure shell session, um, I can connect to a virtual machine in the cloud or some other computer in the world. And then the commands I type, even though I'm typing them on my laptop, aren't running on my laptop. They're typing them here, but they're actually running somewhere else. They're running in the cloud on that virtual machine. Right, so I can I can access both my machine and other machines uh, from one place. So that's a very powerful, uh, powerful thing. Okay, so that's what we're gonna be doing this semester. And, and you, it, it can be a little bit mind-bending at first, for example, Let's say I open up um, a secure shell and I connect to my virtual machine. And I let's say I do like a pip install, I install some packages. All of those packages are installed on my virtual machine in the cloud, which is like a separate computer from mine. So, so after I've done that, maybe I did pip install and I close my terminal and I open a new one. And uh, now I'm just running code on my computer. Well, guess what? I don't have it installed, right? Because even though I ran pip install from my computer, it, it installed somewhere else, not where I am. Uh, right now. So you're going to be setting this up in, in lab one, right? You're going to be setting up a virtual machines and, and kind of getting these sessions. And this is going to be one that's tricky, right? So I really suggest you do this when office hours are available. A lot of people get stuck on small details and you can do a screen share with us and we can kind of walk you through uh, getting your, your virtual machine set up. Okay, so that was the first two big pieces of reproducibility. Will my program run on somebody else's computer? Uh, we have a Python interpreter that's going to help us with uh, the hardware and then the approach we're kind of taking in this class is we have everybody using the same operating system ubuntu linux on uh, on virtual machines uh, next time we'll talk a little bit about package dependencies uh, and here and here's a recap of all those terms that we have learned